Welcome everyone and thanks uh, Sherry for letting us know that we we're alive before we knew we were. Uh, I'm Ruby Rich, I'm the editor of Film Quarterly and I want to welcome you to our inaugural Page Views webinar. This is the first one we've ever done, not our first webinar, but the first one for Page Views. We're going to be doing them from now on. And I just want to explain what Page Views is. It's a feature that's been in Film Quarterly for the past, I don't know, seven years. And um, the editor of Page Views now is Bruno Guarana. And uh, every issue, he picks a book that's forthcoming uh, to focus on and um, talks about the book as he will in a moment here, and also does a really extended interview with the author about their research, their process, their thinking, what they're doing next, all of that, because we felt that not enough attention gets paid to film books in the mainstream press, and that we ought to be doing more than those kind of back of back of the book pages, which we still do, don't get me wrong, but we wanted to do something more. And so we started Page Views and now we're starting the Page View webinar, this first one with Samantha Shepard on the occasion of her book, Sporting Blackness, Race, Embodiment and Critical Muscle Memory on Screen. And uh, Bruno is gonna be in conversation with Samantha, uh, extending what they started in the pages of the book, of the magazine, and then uh, they're going to be joined very quickly by Travis Vogan, uh, who has worked with Samantha and who's going to be joining in on the conversation about film, sports, and race. And I really look forward to it. We've got a one-hour session today, and I'll be back at the very end uh, to wrap things up and say so long. And for now, I'm going to turn this over to Bruno, and uh, we'll get started with the conversation. Bruno? Thanks, Ruby, and thanks for Samantha and Travis for joining us today. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit nervous because there's a lot of stake in, in initiating a new series of webinars, um, but also because here's the book, right? Samantha's book. I, this is such a fantastic read that I, I find myself unable to actually encompass everything that, that it does and that it did to me as a reader too. I learned a lot from me, so uh, from, from the book. So I wanted to thank Samantha for, for sharing her research and for putting it all together in such a, an exciting, Pro style, um, which is actually very rare in academic books, um, and, and dense and important material. Um, so, I have a few words about the book to sort of introduce it to the, the our viewers that might not have read the book yet. I highly recommend it. So, don't just use the webinar as a shortcut. Um, so, in a nutshell, her book sort of seeks to examine race and representation in contemporary sports film. Um, and it was a very surprising read to me because. I personally have very little interest in sports film as a genre. Um, and, and in fact, that didn't keep me from enjoying the book at all. Sometimes, and many times throughout the read, I felt like the book was speaking to me as if Samantha had written the book for someone like me, sort of reminding me that there's very little scholarly and critical attention lent to the genre itself. Um, and even though, despite the popularity of the genre, we, probably have a favorite sports film that we have not thought of uh, much or in, in serious terms. And Samantha teaches us to reconsider these films and reconsider them and how they negotiate race vis-a-vis -vis athletic prowess, right? How they represent um, specifically black athletes. Um, so an example that keeps coming back in my mind that she gives um, in the book is from Penny Marshall's A League of Their Own. Um, and the, the, the the film is about two hours long and there's a 13 second uh, scene in which a black woman uh, who's standing outside of a baseball field kneels down to pick up a baseball that had fallen out of the field and she throws it back with great dexterity to the surprise of the white female athletes that are on the field. Um, and she uses that moment to sort of unravel the racial politics of the film and the gender politics of the genre itself, right? So how the film uses those few seconds to sort of perhaps comment on the segregation um, and marginalization, even exclusion of black women from the league that they were creating in the film, um, as well as the, um, the exclusion of, of black women in the genre as a whole, right? Um, and I think that this, the latter is sort of some of this read on top of the, the film's read on the racial politics. And I think that, that what she does here with that film is analogous to what she does in the book about the genre itself, trying to uncover these deeper meanings in the genre and asking us to reconsider it, right, as, as important. Um, so in, in the span of four chapters, 
she manages to expand the concept of the sports film genre, at least in the way that I understood originally. And I think we had a little bit of that debate in our conversation originally when I was like, this film ex escapes the genre. And he said, no, it does not. Um, so you know, even then she's teaching me more. Um, and uh, so, so each chapter covers a different aspect of the genre. It starts with documentary sports films. Um, then she moves on to a multimedia racial icon in the figure of Booby Miles, which I hope we'll return to. Um, and then uh, representation of black female athletes in the more mainstream films. And finally, my favorite chapter, which is the one on, on experimental films. And I'm not very a big fan of um, exper experimental films, but, but here I am, right? And the focus <laughs> of that chapter is, is Garima's Hourglass. Um, and, and I finished the book and I had to immediately go back to the film and watch it. Um, and, and that's the opening of my intro to the book um, is referring to that film, right? Sort of using Samantha's read of the film to illuminate how I'm now thinking about the film and what, what that happened, what happens there. Um, so for me, I think the book effectively enables and activates what she calls a critical muscle memory. And it made me a lot more attuned to the polyvalence of the black athlete uh, or the black sporting body, as she likes to call it on screen as well as elsewhere. Um, and I would say perhaps that the book has, has had two long-term consequences for me. The first one um, is that the expansion of the genre, right? And, and that now all of a sudden I'm, I'm looking to watch more sports films. Um, so I, I, this, is, this is my way of, of selling the book for people that are not into, into the genre, right? Don't, don't be uh, scared away from it. And the second consequence is that it, in a way, her book ruins sports for me as well. <laughs> Um, I'm not an avid sports watcher, especially in the U.S. I don't understand football. I don't understand basketball or baseball. Um, I watch soccer and I watch volleyball. Coming from Brazil, I think that, that says a lot. Um, but, but even in thinking, you know, watching these games and thinking about the racial politics in Brazil, which is its own can of worms, right? Um, so when I say she ruins sports for me, it's, it's, it's a joke and in a, in a good way, right? It, it makes me think about sports more critically. We tend to think about sports as apolitical and she is here to really prove that that's not at all the case, that there's a racial politics um, within, on the field, within the screen as it represents um, sports um, and, and outside of it, right? Um, and how we sort of, we try to tame these sports, uh, these athletes um, away from exercising their civic right and their civic duties um, outside of the field. Um, so how, how do I don't want to close this? I think the book feels urgent and it is expressively political. And it's one of those books that feels, that changes and seems to speak about the moment in which you read it, no matter when you're reading it. Um, I read it back in May when, as soon as the, the video of Ahmad Arbery's death was released and, uh, and here we are talking about the book and there's other things going on that are very much in relation to what the book is right it, it, it's talking about. So I really appreciate that ability that the book has to adapt and ask us to reconsider its text as we go along, right? As we read it in different moments. Um, so I guess my first question to you, Samantha, is to go back a little bit. Um, would be about the origins of the book. What what sparked your interest in the sports film genre, um, in this topic in particular, and also how did the, how did the project start? First of all, I want to say thank you, Bruno, for that that in, that introduction and the framing of the work and your critical and thoughtful engagement with my text, um, especially as a reluctant sports person. Um, but the fact that you you were able to um, excavate um, both many takeaways, but also what I what I like to think is the the intervention um, of the project. I'm so very appreciative, and um, everyone should check out you know Bruno's um, work and page views, not just to read about my book, though that is a definite plus, <laughs> um, but <laughs> because of um, the thoughtfulness of the writing um, and the engagement. And of course, thank you to Film Quarterly for hosting this entire event. Um, as you can imagine, it feels very nice to have um, my book um, kickstart a new series. Um, as you can tell, I put on my good lip for this event, so this is <laughs> real 
top-notch experience um, right now. But um, to your actual question, sorry about that. Um, um, I definitely want to say that this project is deeply invested in thinking about Black performativity. And I was really, really um, concerned with the spaces and places that we are not talking about Blackness, um, both in terms of um, there's a lot of great critical work done in early silent cinema by many mentors and friends and um, you know people who've taken on genres and movements, um, whether that be Black exploitation or race films. And I was just like, look at all of these bodies in this genre and there is no one talking about these films um, really critically or um, in ways that move us beyond sort of pointing out the kinds of representational politics as in like, oh, this is really negative or bad. Um, and, and there was a body of literature that was small, but really critical to, to my understanding of the genre, including work by Aaron Baker, Deborah Tudor, um, David Leonard, um, um, and Grant Barrett. And so I really was, really was moved by how people were beginning to um, understand the genre. And, you know, I also played sports, as I mentioned, I was um, a, a soccer player um, and played all the way through college. So I think I may, I may have been, mm, did I play in college? Mm, did I sit on the bench? Did I stop bringing out my shin guards? All those sort of <laughs> things. Yeah, I wasn't really playing at the end, but you know, um, but I was there and it was freezing. Um, I was at Dartmouth, so you can imagine the cold. Um, so I, I have a deep love of sports and a deep ambivalence um, about them. But as a genre, I really have just been wanting to think about this since I was in grad school, because I was just so profoundly moved by thinking about Black performativity. Um, and I have been critically pushed by so many wonderful scholars, including um, uh, Michael Gillespie and Film Blackness, to think, again, what are the consequential ways that Blackness can function in a genre? Um, so that's why there's a real move to not just think about skin in the game or racial representations, but skin in the genre. So moving from just description, but to a form of analytical um, analysis that can come from thinking about how race animates, constructs, and deconstructs the kinds of modes, codes, and conventions that we see in the sports film. And, you know, I just, I just like to write about things that I like, and I just love Black people. So this was a really easy job. Um, over many years that I hated, of course, but but really, really fun, fun opportunity. And you started that as your dissertation, right? Yes, it started off, it's based on a dissertation that I wrote, um, for which you should never read, don't go back. Okay. Almost, almost go forward. <laughs> um, but it started on a, a project that was, um, um, that was about thinking about race and performance in contemporary sports films, but itself was had not fully understood what would what later be the kind of arc line through critical muscle memory. I that sort of buried in the conclusion there because you know my my great um, advisors Kathleen McHugh and Ali Field were like, "This is great. You have no idea what this is yet. You cannot have that be the thing if you don't really actually know what you're saying." Um, so so that project itself was just a, a beginning interrogation of trying to think about how to talk about. Um, um, race and, and, and the genre, which later gets moved into thinking about how we can think about um, um, think about the representation of embodied resonance and, and, and blackness on screen and the tangled and material histories that are evident when we look at representations of, of black athletic bodies on screen. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to ask you about the dissertation because you had told me about how critical muscle memory was, was a term that you had to put in a conclusion. And I think that's a Having come out of that process myself, I think that's a great story to hear um, for, for grad students to hear that you know, dissertation can be the germ that will then turn into something else, right? Like those things that we push to the margins a little bit could then become the central key term, which which happens in your book. Um, and and we'll talk about that term, which which I think is very very valuable and exciting in many ways. Um, but I wanted to mention a little bit about, mention your enthusiasm that comes across in the book. Um, and what I was really happy about when I got my copy was um, how that comes as early as in the acknowledgements page. Um, and you finish the, the, the page by quoting Megan Rapinoe, um, saying, we did it, we deserve this, everything. Um, and so I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the collaborations that led you to finalize the project, including um, your mention of Travis was here, and, and that will give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that collaboration as well. Of course. No, thank you. So 
the acknowledgements are my favorite part of a book. You should just buy this for the acknowledgements alone. Um, and if I ever met you, your name is probably in here. Um, you said like, good job, keep going. Um, I, I tried to recognize you, but I was um, finishing the book, as you mentioned, um, during the World Cup. Um, and I was just, once they had won, I was just so moved by all of this absolute joy, not just coming from winning, because I mean, we can be critical of, of, of winning, but it was all of these women just owning their success. And I just, I just, I, I just loved it. And the idea that they were like, I deserve all of this. Look, this is, I wrote this, I had, you know, two small children, um, you know, jobs, losses, etc. Like, all of this has been a great thing and every like we deserve to celebrate this even as an extension of me and all people who have made this work possible and one of those people who i have been in conversation with about this work is travis um who has um who has seen it for a long time and um, i think if, if he unmuted himself he would say oh yes i i tried to get this book for for a different press <laughs> yes so i tried to get this book for a different press but I, you know <laughs> He did. So he had been around for a long time. And even when I may have it slightly just juke the book somewhere else, um, um, he's been been really, really supportive and, um, and a great thinker whose work I have gone to many times to understand um, sports media, um, all his writings on sports documentaries and the special issues that he's put together in the Journal of Sports History um, have been really foundational to the book and to the chapters um, themselves, as well as the work of Aaron Baker, who helped um, um, him along with Michael. Um, they helped put on a basically a, what would you call that? Um, a manuscript workshop, um, helping to, mm. to push the book, um, to take your favorite chapter on Revolt of the Black Athlete. As Michael said to me, um, this could be a BFI classics. You you have to shorten this. Oh, wow. <laughs> your is very long and you've got to use your footnotes. Um, and so um, I've got so many great notes and great insights from so many people. And it's it's been a really, really fantastic opportunity to think with uh, um, people who I deeply admire. Um, in the time that I wrote one book, Travis wrote three. So um, <laughs> I had to jump on that train and we together did this edited collection um, called Sporting Realities, Critical Readings of a Sports Documentary, which is available at all local and um, online realtors. Um, so you can pick up a copy of that. It's got so many great scholars who are talking about the sports documentary in really critical and innovative and exciting ways. You agree, Travis? I mean, yeah, let's open this up and sure. hear from everybody. Travis, you can speak in your own voice. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Thank you, Sam. Uh, no, it's been great. I mean, I, I feel like there's there's a group of folks, it's a small group, just like any, you know, kind of sub-sub uh, field of uh, folks who are studying sport and media right now. And, you know, obviously Samantha, Vicki Johnson, um, Aaron Baker, uh, Jen McLaren. It's, it's just a really nice group to kind of be in contact with because everyone's incredibly supportive and, and really interesting and doing a lot of, of diverse work. Um, and so Samantha and I got to know each other kind of through that small network and, it, and you know, we've become, you know, colleagues and friends since then. So it's been, it's been really fun for me to see this project go from something that was just a recently completed dissertation to something that kind of started landing in different journals as as articles to this kind of full-fledged project and I think a project that's that's probably going to to develop and and generate other projects that are kind of growing from it both the ones that Sam um, winds up producing herself and I think the ones that this book is sure to inspire you know I think that there are a number of concepts in this book that are really useful and that are going to have some pretty significant legs even beyond the sports film I think you know critical muscle memory is probably the key one but the idea of skin in the genre um, and, and so forth are going to be I think um, pretty useful for people as they're kind of trying to think through this idea of embodiment on screen and kind of how it's historicized and um, yeah, so it's been exciting to kind of see that and to be a small part of it for sure. Samantha, can you talk about both of those before Bruno goes to his next question? I'd be curious to 
hear you unpack both of those. Uh, that was my next muscle question. memory and skin the game. <laughs> Sorry, Bruna. Absolutely. That's perfect. Absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll start with critical muscle memory. So um, this is a term that, um, that I coined, obviously, um, borrowing from human kinetics, um, the concept of muscle memory so that, you know, ritualized and habitual practice or exercise creates a kind of um, physiological response which is obviously tied to our cognition, but it's the ability to feel like you can reproduce past movements um, with ease or um, facility that, that, that belies the kind of labor um, that goes into, um, that goes into to movement and performance-based arts, whether that be sports or dance or, or music. Um, and I was really also moved by a lot of work that I saw in, um, um, in Black studies and Black cultural studies that was trying to think about Black memorial practices or Black memory. And so that was something that was coming through, obviously, um, in terms of the nice intersection between, um, between cultural studies and sports with um, Beyond a Boundary and CLR. Um, um, James's um, piece when he was thinking particularly about muscle memory and cricket, um, but I was seeing it also as this muscle that becomes, you know, trained, disciplined, and flexed um, in terms of relationship to terror. Um, so the work of Elizabeth Alexander, the work of Frantz Fanon, and the idea of, you know, the effects of colonialism and muscle um, and muscle tension. Um, but I was also thinking about it as a way of thinking about um, repeated experiences, um, Black, um, you know, celebrating sort of Black, you know, first or um, forms of quote unquote Black excellence, um, and really moved by the work of Harvey Young and Houston Baker. Um, and so I was trying to wed these two things while also trying to be very specific about what does this mean for this term um, to, to also become articulated through cinema. So the idea of the projection, the idea of the um, kinesis, the idea of the formal practices. And that's gonna actually connect us to the concept of skin in the genre. Because when it comes to critical muscle memory, it can be a descriptor. So it can be the ways in which I think, oh, Booby Miles becomes this cautionary tale for many, um, you know, um, tales of young black men who desire to have um, careers, you know, in the NFL, but are curtailed by injury. But at the same time, we have to think about how it becomes formalized, not just as in a description, descriptive kind of term, but becomes formalized um, through um, through sort of cinema's powers and regimes of representation. Um, so I wanted to locate moments where, whether that was the mode itself, like the, the discursivity and the circularity of um, the recursivity of sports documentaries, or to the Booby Miles point, whether it's a moment where we see um, Booby Miles actually on screen with his on screen character and he becomes doubled. So we get this kind of doubling, this kind of memory work happening, past and present, um, the reliving, the witnessing of one's undoing. Um, it, it speaks to a kind of embodied resonance. And so trying to think about skin in the genre is asking, okay, so if we think about it as a descriptive term, what can we point out? If we think about it as a mode of analysis, how is it being represented? Are we seeing close-ups that do this? Are we seeing, um, um, you know, a voiceover narration that allows for these moments? There's actually an interesting point in the book that I, um, I think I became kind of lucky with, because um, I don't think I recognized it at first, but, um, in the chapter on black sports documentaries, I talk about the film Hoop Reality. And Hoop Reality is an unofficial sequel of sorts to Hoop Dreams, um, which is obviously everybody, you know Hoop Dreams from your understanding of documentary film. It's, it's, it transcends sports films and yet it's so, um, it, it's, it's, it's so important to the sports film documentary. But Hoop Reality is this unofficial sequel that, that picks up, quote unquote, um, a new figure on this sort of desire for NBA success. And Arthur Agee from the original Hoop Dreams is in Hoop Reality. Um, and so there's a recursive way he becomes tangled to this exact same kind of discursive narrative about um, um, basketball. Um, but there's an actual photo. I'm going to see if you all can see this if I bring this close enough. He's standing there and he's with Patrick Beverly. Now, Patrick Beverly, shout out to Patrick Beverly, my favorite six man, um, who, uh, who is currently playing in the NBA. He did have his hoop dream success, but he's standing there and Patrick Beverly is wearing a 
shirt that says remember me which is also um which is really somewhat sad it's it's it's, it's visceral because it's 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 an image of a person who has been who has been killed right but even just in the iconography of that that frame of ag standing there who's supposed to be looking at somebody who's supposed to represent another version of him and we get this sort of even visual discursive reminder of how these bodies remember how these bodies are made to project a kind of memory um, um we get this kind of sort of representational representational um texture and i'm really interested in this book of thinking about the body as a canvas of representation that can mean and mean again on screen. So in that little just moment and scene and image in the book, we get this like, remember, remember these bodies, remember these stories, stories, remember these histories, um, literally, you know, written out for us as text. Um, and um, so critical muscle memory just lets us remember that the body is a text made of text. Um, and so um, I just want to excavate those histories, um, which could go on and on and on. Um, but, you know, there's a word count limit. So got to stop. Yeah, to me, the, the, we talked a little bit about this in our conversation, too, that critical muscle memory also operates on the level of, of reception, right, as an affect on the expect, spectator. Um, and this comes across in the example that you gave us. So the film is also asking us to remember something. So, right, and, and that, that's an embodied experience as well. Um, but also Garima does that a lot with, with the, the, the references that he makes that are sort of sometimes subtle, sometimes more on the nose, but it, it sort of, and you historicize that for us, right? You, you allow us to um, understand where these references are coming from and, and guiding us through that critical muscle memory. So, so as I mentioned before, I think it's a very um, useful um, term that could, could expand in many different directions. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with you. Garima does it, um, Big Crit does it when he reimagines Booby Miles, who is you know, my favorite um, football player ever. Um, when he re reimagines him away from this narrative of undoing and pathology um, and lets him be a winner, you know, he, he, he cuts and, um, um, and chops up the, 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 the film. Um, so it becomes an opening to, to his discursive um, articulations of himself as a hometown hero in terms of being a rapper. So when Booby says, you know, God made um, black, um, um, God made Booby black and black is strong, you know, Booby knocks some fools out, Booby knocks them out with black Nikes on his feet. You know, you can't help but think to yourself, yes, finally, all of this bravado, all of this is just a celebration of blackness. And instead, we don't have to get to this moment where he has to be humbled by injury, humbled by undoing, humbled by what we know to be a sort of a narrative death because he kind of leaves the story, but also what we, what, we, what we think is the ellipsis of his life, um, which sadly, and I'm interested in the textualization of Booby, but we have to recognize the last time that we see him on screen. I had to end up adding this right at the end of doing page proofs. Um, he, he's in, the last time he's actually on screen is in Bus Bissinger's um, documentary Buzz, um, and he's incarcerated. And so the cinematic Booby <laughs> has, um, has played out a very familiar narrative, but the ways in which um, Big Crit um, does a different kind of theorizing of, of booby sporting blackness to me is really about reclamation and his own spectatorial affect, which I think is really, really key. And it, it plays out through, you know, the introduction with, of course, Serena Williams. Yeah. Yes. She's just, you know, she's moving us to, to and compelling us to think, you know, and to see and to believe in new things. Uh, I think I read somewhere that uh, that's your favorite chapter on booby miles, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that he, his figure allows you to navigate through, uh, through many different media. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what is his function in, in the book beyond just being a character that you're interested in and invested in? Uh, and maybe Travis um, can speak a little bit about that too in his iterations in documentary as well. Yeah, no, I think that Booby is such a compelling figure. I think that Nicole Fleetwood's articulation of racial iconicity were so critical to this chapter to understanding the, the, the ways in which duality between veneration and degradation um, um, end up being re, reworked um, in each version of, of, of Booby's um, um, representation from literary um, in Bissinger's original um, book to the film version in 2004 to the television series where he's there and not there. Um, he's sort of um, diffracted over three different characters and then of course with Big Crit's um, music videos for Hometown Hero and Booby Miles and I think this is where 
and I'm going to borrow from a previous talk because I really appreciated how they said this, but it really gets at the elasticity, you know, um, and I think you also said this, Bruno, um, of of the concept of where we see critical muscle memory and sporting blackness having legs to move um, beyond just talking about the sports film, but um, to thinking about the sort of dynamic athleticism of the body um, that can be sort of shaped and reworked um, within different um, different mediums and medias, um, um, and therefore kind of have a different articulation of what sporting blackness can be. Because by the time you get to to big crit, I'm saying there's something else really great here. But if you read them as Bissinger, it's a you know it's a projected interiority in a literary mythos that is a cautionary tale. And when you see him in you know Berg's film, you know it's just we're supposed to just feel terrible for him, and also he's supposed to be punished. He's got to learn to be a team player. And I'm like, what team? I feel like, I feel like remember the Titans when he's like, what, wear myself out for the team? What team? Like, this is, he's doing all of this. Also, it's, you know, three days ago, it was, um, remember the Titans 20th anniversary. So um, shout out to Denzel, um, to all my friends. Um, but, but yeah, no, I just think that, that this is where we see the elasticity of the concept. Um, and in a different way to do transmedia studies outside of just thinking about transmedia storytelling and um, um, in, in a very particular sort of, you know, Jenkins kind of way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about like the, the, the particular use or the, the, the value of sports documentaries, right? And, and I think Travis, you, you could jump in here a little bit about that. In terms of critical? In terms, yeah. I mean, critical muscle memory or, or representing blackness. Um, I think Samantha writes a little bit about how the documentary allows uh, these black athletes to regain control over their voice, right? And, and sort of convey their sub subjectivity in a more direct way than, than in other films. Well, one, one of the things that I really appreciate about Samantha's work is that, you know, I think sometimes we tend to limit our thinking about kind of, you know, if to use another one of her terms, historical contestants to a kind of documentary genre, which is explicitly devoted to um, a kind of empiricism that's, that's trying to excavate some sort of past. And, and one of the things that I, that I really like about um, Sporting Blackness is that it shows us that these these memories and these you know indexes of many different embodied pasts are happening across genres, you know. And so when you see Vince in season five of Friday Night Lights, you know that's that's kind of referencing this Booby Miles as a person, but also Booby Miles as a kind of archetype that spans you know across these genres and you know into kind of media that are purporting to index a kind of reality and past, but also media that are inventing it. And I like, you know, Sam just mentioned this idea of elasticity and allowing it to have that kind of, you know, historical and um, epistemological flexibility to deal with these kinds of dicey um, politicized issues. I really, you know, I appreciate that. But obviously documentaries are doing a different sort of, of work you know, if by, if by no other kind of uh, token than their kind of explicit claims to be looking at the past, you know, I think that that's something that needs to be taken separately. But I like how Samantha is forcing us to or encouraging us to look at the kind of, you know, documentary sort of work that other genres are doing. And I was going to ask you about Remember the Titans, because, you know, there's a kind of like, it, the, the recent, you know, very small discussions that have been going on about its 20th anniversary are kind of operating in the register of like a, a sort of memory of this work that is doing this kind of critical muscle memory. Um, and it seems to kind of be in dialogue with some of the things that you're talking about in interesting ways. And also, of course, we can't divorce it from all of the kind of... Um, recent reevaluation of a lot of black text that's been happening um, in this last year. Um, one of the things that I was going to ask Samantha about is like how this last year, some of the things that have been going on recently have resonated with, with the book as you kind of see it out in the world in the last couple of months. Yeah, I think, thank you for that. Um, for the last part of it, I think, I mean, I, 
Bruno, I think you said something at the beginning that um, I absolutely agree with. Um, I think this book feels very timely, but if it came out last year, I think it would have also felt interestingly timely. Um, and maybe because um, the, the, the interest in, in history, um, pointing out kind of a sort of a narrative of this history of sort of the, the black athlete kind of becoming more and more um, aware and conscious and also um, articulating their various versions of revolt in different ways. But now that, you know, we have the WNBA being even more active, I mean, the, though they were at the foreground for so shout out to the WNBA well before the um, NBA, um, um, when it comes to talking about um, police brutality and racial injustice, then you've got now what the NBA has done even in this past bubble. So I have been, you know, really grateful to be in conversation with, you know, great people like historian Amira Rose Davis, who really, you know, um, helped me think about the ways in which we could understand this current moment of athletic protest, um, the wildcat strike, um, you know, obviously Colin Kaepernick, um, but even the ways in which we see like, you know, um, college players trying to unionize, you know, I feel like this book is really sort of asking me to have, um, to say something particular about the social world, um, to which I would have probably also still said, no, thank you. Um, Cause I think I am saying something about the social world, but in the ways that I think you have already articulated Travis about the ways we imagine that world, which is why we think we need those fantasies. We're being critical about these false narratives of interracial cooperation, but then ESPN is celebrating, oh, remember the Titans came out 20 years ago and it's so, so exciting. And it's like, that film not only does it play loose and fast with you know the history of of, of that team um, and the sort of hagiographic um, treatment of of Coach Boone played by Denzel Washington, but um, I recently had a chance to write a bit for um, the Velvet Light Trap about this piece called Glorious Bones. So as you all may know, again another time to point out this great book. Um, the cover is done by a Canadian artist named Esma Muhammad, um, and the image is from her photograph Untitled No Fields. Um, and she also has this really great piece called Glorious Bones, and it basically is 46 um, heads um, football heads that are colored in these vibrant African prints and um, she's gutted the protective um, stuff inside of it and put them atop hot steel um, rods um, and there's dirt covering the floor and around um, in the gallery space just like my chair rail here it has the, the quote from Remember the Titans um, when he when Denzel goes and he um, takes them on a night run and he starts he goes to the Battle of Gettysburg and he's like you know these brothers they kill themselves with malice in their heart come together just all this racial fantasy right and I'm really interested in thinking about how we need that circularity between the social and the cultural imaginary and the recyclability of that um, for these kinds of both critical muscle memories that become reimagined but how sports cinema plays a really distinct role in how we remember a moment and more importantly how we understand the framing of now. And so that's why I say it isn't any of the other films, even though I do mention um, High Flying Bird, it's Hourglass that is the film of this moment. This film is about what happens if we stop playing. There is real work that we need to do. And I'm sorry, the revolution is not going to be in quarters and halves. It's just not, it's all, it's all in overtime. It is all, it's all the extra time that we need. Um, and so I think that film is really, really, um, is, is really urgent. So I think I would wish I would have um, added to this text uh, actually a bit more experimental work that was pushing on the genre. I think um, Hourglass is not the only piece to do that. And having just done an event with Canyon Cinema and um, seeing some of the lineup they put in there, um, Keith Piper's work, um, um, The Peace Gymnast by Megan Reed, I was just like, <sighs> experimental film is where it's at. <laughs> they are really pushing, pushing us to imagine sports um, in a different way, in a way that is really challenging, which I think um, responds to this moment and the challenges that we face, particularly sports with no sports. What an interesting- do you, think, do you think, Sam, that there's something about experimental cinema that, or experimental media in general? Because you're looking at art, you're looking at cinema, you're looking at television, but 
do you think there's something about experimental media that really kind of speaks in interesting ways to sports in particular because of sports kind of inherent narrativity and also the kind of quantified way that we oftentimes look at sports through statistics and whatnot. I know that Brett and the folks at, at Insight did a really nice um, issue recently and there's not much work on that. I mean, do you see that as, as really kind of lending itself to sports in a unique way? Or did you find that with Hourglass as well? No, I do. I, I completely agree. I think I think Brett's um, 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 Brett's work with Insight and also I'm saying her name right, Astria, um, um, her work as well, um, um, co-editing that is that I think experimental. It's 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 not just the narr narr um, the narratization of sports. It's in the drama of it and the accounting and the statistics. I also think it's the way that a lot of experimental sports media really is about breaking down and showing us fragments or removing key critical parts so that we can focus on something else. So one thing like when I teach, you know, a sports film class to students and I'm like, you know, Disney has given us so much um, in terms of these sports films. It, of course, remember the Titans, you know, Miracle, Air Bud, Cool Runnings, McFarland USA. We are primed to a kind of visual, um, sonic and cinematic experience. And I think that um, experimental sports media puts that puts that to us um, in a different and, and compelling way. And even if you can, of course, I still think that these other works are, are really, really, um, these even mainstream works can be really, really um, complex um, as we see with Soderbergh's High Flying Bird, um, a sports film that is uninterested with uh, showing any basketball at all, but it's just all about basketball um, in a really compelling and interesting way. Um, and I'm going to use this time to say one more thing about critical muscle memory, because I just think it's, um, as a concept, I love looking at the body on screen because I really think, of course, every moment of improvisation is, is actually a recognition of an archive of movements um, that have been um, practiced and honed and created that have a history and a legacy. Um, you know, everything has a story. So if you look at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and you look at his, you know, um, sky hook, you know, that's a story of the body innovating um, in relationship to rules and prohibitions um, in college sports. And I think this kind of attention to improvisation of the body and movement and performativity um, as being both the future and something new, but also being a reckoning with the past um, and various social, um, political and embodied forces um, is really, really key and critical. Sam, while you're on that, there's an interesting question in the chat from Beth Corzo Jucartos here, asking if you could talk about that at the site of reception and about how muscle memory is involved in the spectatorial experience, especially she's talking about sporting events, bars, TV, social settings, and video games. Anything you wanna say about that? Absolutely. So I was just telling, telling um, um, Jennifer McLaren um, and, and others about the ways in which at the end of the book, I sort of mentioned that critical muscle memory, of course, has this kind of um, kind of valence to begin to talk a lot more about um, reception and spectatorial experiences, but that I was not equipped anymore to do that. And it was like the last paragraph. So I was like exit plan strategy, period. Um, go to, you know, go to the bibliography for more information. Um, because I know that it does, because that's what I'm talking about. That's, that, that's the feeling. That's when I watch these movies and I, for some reason, just, I'm gripped with something. It's, it's, it's in our bodies. And I think that's responding. That's why in the introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Lynn Linda Williams' body genres, but trying to recognize, of course, she's she's charting something different um, through horror, um, melodrama, and pornography, but there is a visceral response because of this um, itself, what we're looking at is so embodied and ludic, um, and so um, there is something to watch this. I watch these films, not because they're all great. I mean, the, the work I did for Joanna Man is, is that is Pulitzer work. Um, so feel free to, <laughs> to nominate me for set of war because that is not a good film. It's, it's, it's deeply offensive. Um, but, but there's something about seeing the body move and having this physical reaction of understanding what something is being articulated. And in that film, it was to me about a kind of proprioceptive understanding 
understanding of the ways that women's bodies are allowed and not allowed to, to be free, to freely move, to take up space, um, and how the camera also keeps that hemmed inness. And so something about watching Joanna play like, um, try to play like a girl, having to hem the body in um, was really, really interesting. And I think about my own play and awareness of myself as an athlete or when I'm running and I'm just sort of like the freest that I am and don't give me, you know, braids. I'm just slapping in the wind, like just feeling great, this kind of movement. So I think the term really has a way to, to grapple with the kinds of very real experiences we have when we watch sports um, um, live um, where we are, we are caught up in emotion because sports themselves are, are narratives that are highly dramatic um, and um, are definitely um, effectively quite engaging. You know, grown men get to hug each other and, and cry and, you know, and, and be moved to tears. Yeah. Travis, any thoughts on that? Of grown men crying? Yeah. <laughs> you know. I support it. <laughs> I'm wondering, Samantha, um, uh, you, you teach sporting blackness, uh, correct? Or, or, or sports class? Class. I um, yeah. how, how do you how do you bring that your research into the classroom and, and how has been your experience doing that with students um do they sort of experience this critical muscle memory in some ways or or and I, i'm assuming you probably don't use that term um with undergraduates but but you know do, do you see any kind of reactions is anything interesting happening in the classroom as you as you introduce them to these films through a particularly critical perspective that's such a great, great question. So when I teach it, you know, I don't teach uh, a, like a sporting blackness. I do like more of a sort of wider um, engagement with, you know, points of intersectionality. So we start with um, not New Barakti. What am I saying? What's 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 the one about? Oh God, what do we start with? The one with the, the footballer who um, Native American footballer. Yes, Jim Thorpe, all-American hero. Yes, we start with Jim Thorpe. You know, and they're always like, and they get it from the jump because they're like, oh my God, this is just all about the terribleness of whiteness. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and it's just like, they're like, they're, you know, he's trying to, trying to civilize him, all of these things, and there's so much punishment. Um, so the students really see the, um, you know, the narrative themselves sort of play out um, in, in really sort of complex ways. Because to me, sports films are so deeply invested in thinking about race and politics, even though we have that refrain about keep, you know, politics out of sports. And it's like, that is the only interesting thing about them. And and in the sports films, sports films know that. That's why they take on issues of race. They love to solve racial problems. They love to think about gender. They love to think about these kinds of critical concepts. So the students really, really take to, um, um, take to working through the genre in a really interesting way. And, and like you, they say things like, oh, you, you know, you've ruined sports for me, or you've really made me think hard. And I was like, that's why they pay me the big bucks, because, you know, if that, if I don't get that effect, then I don't get my check. And so it's just, you know, one of those things where they really, they love being able to do that and then taking that to how they engage with sports media more broadly. So like commercials and like, you know, a Nike commercial or thinking about advertisements or thinking about, you know, what does it mean to see Ronda Rousey say, you know, I'm not a do nothing bitch, you know, like what does that mean? And how is that kind of trafficking in a kind of sort of, um, sort of both um, gendered transgression as well as, you know, a stereotype at the same time. So they, they really like working through, um, through all of this stuff, even if they, they don't like deadlines. Too much reading, but you know. Yeah, I kept wondering, how do you watch ESPN <laughs> after your book, right? And, oh, and just pretend that it's just happening in front of the screen, in front of you. Sports. Low key, don't like them. I'm just kidding. That's. <laughs> I mean, it's not that I don't like sports. I do. I like highlight sports. I like to watch it when it gets like now. I'm we're in playoffs. I'll get me to the finals. I can't watch you build up. I'm not, I need, I, sports films have ruined me. I need to see, is this, is this a meaningful moment? Is this going to get us to the training montage, to the comeback, to the win? I can't, so I just can't be there through the small bits of it all. But, um, but you know, it, it can be very difficult to watch because it's so misogynistic. They do not give women's sports enough 
focus and enough attention. Um, and you can even see in the way we're talking about this moment of political unrest. And again, with Maya Moore, the WNBA, who have been on the front lines of all of these various things while doing different forms of caretaking. And it's you know just about what does Charles Barkley think about Breonna Taylor's um, verdict? And I'm just sort of like, I want to say officially for the record for my 34 viewers, you know, fuck Charles Barkley, because at the kind of things that he said in terms of, we didn't have to bleep this out. I don't know if this was a family friendly show, but, um, but <laughs> go for it. It, what he ended up saying about how her situation was different. Um, and it just speaks to a very particular kind of misogynoir that we see in sports. And we obviously see in the social world and the kinds of lack of justice that um, black women receive um, writ large. So I definitely think all of those things. You know, I wonder, I'm going to throw something to you. Um, what do you think about the place of this work within film studies? Do you think that because of a kind of attitude towards sports within the hierarchy of genres in film studies, that, that a lot of this work has been ignored um, and, and it, you know, and really has been a loss in terms of thinking through film? I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that there, like, like Travis was saying, there's a small group of people who are in conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sports, even as a genre, um, have been sort of deeply under theorized and, and, and there has been a, sort of a lack of critical engagement. In certain ways, I was surprised that this book had not been written um, to a degree. Um, so I was sort of like, that's great. Um, but I think as a whole, also what this book offers for cinema and media studies in terms of method, um, in terms of a deep appreciation for um, textual analysis. Um, like I said, I get lost in those 13 seconds of a league of their own because it's such an important moment, but it also becomes not just skin in the game, but skin in the genre of how we can understand the, the Penny Marshall including a moment that we that didn't have to be there to be able to comment on the whiteness of the of the film um, but to be able to to sort of represent a kind of historical um, erasure um, by, by by having this moment of inclusion ended up speaking to the kind of historical erasure of black women in the sports film genre despite their um, their um, extreme excellence Simone Biles um, um, Simone Manuel um, obviously Serena Williams etc um, so I think that this is a, a really a, I would like to say um, helpful book for anyone studying race and representation. Um, I, I like to think that it um, is in nice conversation with black film studies um, and the crop of work, whether that be film blackness or Raquel's you know, double negative um, um, and all of the people who I'm very grateful to call friends, you know, what call Miriam Petty, Kristen Warner, um, Ellen Scott, Allie Field, um, and of course, it, you know, the, the best of the best, Jacqueline Stewart. Um, so I hope that it's it's a useful piece um, and that people um, engage with it and, and, and engage with it even if they're not talking about sports films. And I think to, to your earlier point, Bruno, about um, how it can be hopefully helpful that people will pick it up, not just because they want to learn more about the sports film genre, but because they want to see how do we think about embodiment? How do, how do we think about race and performativity? Um, um, that it can still be methodologically um, quite useful. Um, that's that's really what I, what I hope. You, you, you foreground the sports genre as a gateway for, for speaking about racial representation, right? And, and in fact, you know, when I said that I, I wasn't particularly interested in, in sports films, I, I approached your book because of its uh, topic on representation of blackness, right? And I stayed through the sports films and, and I'm more interested in sports films now. So I think it works both ways. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the many beauties of the book. Yeah, you, you're touching on something that's really important, I think, Bruno, is that, that there's, I think for folks who study sports, there's sometimes a little bit of a frustration that it's not taken seriously. It's kind of a bad object in certain ways, but it, it should never be about sports, right? The work should never just be about sports. Um, and if it is, it's not very interesting, right? And so you have to kind of, you know, identify the value and, and the possibilities in studying sports, but you can't limit it to that realm. You have to be making those connections like Sam's doing in her book. And so that's been an interesting thing to see the folks who are studying sports, what specific kind of directions they're taking it in and what subfields they're engaging. And do you feel that this moment, I know we're just, just almost out of time, but I wonder, well, I should say, 
Samantha, if you haven't had a chance to look at the chat, that uh, Grant Wiedenfeld says that ESPN needs you as a as a guest commentator. Is, so ooh, somebody put <laughs> we'll, that out. We'll, we'll let that put that out. Clout, there. Let's make this happen. Yep. This face is prime time, baby. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it, girl. Meanwhile, meanwhile, before we go, um, do you want to say anything about this particular moment? Like, if you you wrote the book already, the book is out already. But now suddenly we're in a, a completely, you know, previously unimagined moment in terms of sports about, in terms of the politicization of sports and the cessation of sports, both. And I wonder, you know, if, if you were to do an epilogue now, what would you be saying? You know, what would you be adding on to this book in terms of this um, 2020 year? Wow, that's such a great question. I mean, I think that, the revolt of the black athlete chapter that kind of, you know, is, is it, the final subheading is resisting a finish line. Um, I think it would just be a, an engagement, particularly with the mediated ways in which black athletes have been trying to use the media, including the sort of, again, by not playing what they ended up putting um, ESPN and therefore ABC um, and Disney into trying to figure out how to fill visual space with the narrative of, 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 of black athletes not playing um, is a really, really interesting um, sort of addition to the work. And I hope if, if everything goes right with my prayer, um, I can put Serena Williams, number 24, Roland Garros, let's get it. We're going to figure it out um, right at the end. That is also what I would love to be able to cap the book with. But I think it's thinking about, again, moving away from film, but also just thinking about other kinds of mediated um, experiences where we see um, sporting blackness articulated in a way that puts pressure on um, on the codes, the, the codes, um, the modes and conventions of media practices and an, an entire media industry um, in terms of, in terms of um, the sports um, the home of, that is ESPN. Yeah. Well, I think this is a great spot to end. Um, I just want to say for people who want to follow this up um, that you can see in the chat that uh, we've just posted uh, the link to page views. Um, thanks to Mark Francis and Rebecca Prime from Film Quarterly that it's now up on the website. And you can see the conversation that um, Bruno and Samantha had. And you can also download for free the introduction to the book, which is something we do with page views. So take a note of the link or go to filmquarterly.org and see the other webinars we've been doing. Go out and buy Sporting Blackness. Um, support the author, support the press. Yay. And there you go. The next book coming out, co-edited with Travis. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, this is this, this is just a bunch of. Are you like that, here. Sam? <laughs> <laughs> I want to really thank everybody, um, uh, Bruno, for the selection, for helping to inaugurate this new um, Page Views webinar. Thanks, Travis, for coming along. Thanks, Samantha, for letting us do this. Thanks to this great crowd that came. We've had an amazing list of people who've been here. In, in the audience. And I just wanna invite everybody back. Um, October 28th, we're doing the next webinar and we're going to be talking about um, Isaac Julian's new Lessons of the Hour piece about Frederick Douglass. It's gonna be opening um, next month at the McAvoy Fine Arts uh, Gallery in San Francisco. And um, we're gonna have Isaac himself along with uh, Warren Critlow and Kaz Banning who wrote that wonderful article in the last issue of Film Quarterly. And I see Kaz was here today, so thanks. And uh, come on back and we're gonna keep this going. We hope every month we're gonna be doing some kind of webinar up here in, in this Film Quarterly space. Samantha, can't thank you enough for the book and for being game for this. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thanks, thank everyone. You all for so long. Bye-bye.